Good morning. I want to start by inviting you on a journey across space and time. In the next century, beyond our solar system, moving toward another star. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to first of all tell you why I believe pursuing an extraordinary tomorrow, that is human interstellar travel, is really necessary in order for us to build a better world today. And the reason it's necessary is because it fosters radical leaps. Radical leaps in innovation, in technology, in our knowledge and understanding of the universe, our knowledge and understanding of ourselves. And today, right now, we desperately need those kinds of radical leaps. To talk about this, I'm gonna go back to when I was growing up. In the 1960s, it was an incredible time. It seemed like our potential was limitless. Everywhere we looked, new things were happening, right? There was a new particle discovered. There was, um, people were doing things differently. When you think about the 60s, everybody always talks about the 60s as being a time of anarchy. But really, I was a little girl through the 60s, and what I remember about them was that everybody wanted to participate, and they thought they had a right to participate in the world. When we look at the civil rights movement and decolonialization across the world and women's rights and all of those things, that was about saying that we could participate. These were really radical changes. We looked at entertainment, Judith Jameson, I wanted to dance like her, I wanted to grow up to be a dancer. Star Trek, original series Star Trek fan, it said that we could get past our nuclear war and all the things that were happening then. Computers were coming online, we we're really starting to get in semiconductors, and of course, we landed on the moon, which has been one of those themes that happened because space exploration then became a part of our everyday lives. We thought of space exploration, um, and it impacted me. It made a difference in my world. I went on and did other things. I started as an MD and an engineer and other things, and I've been a citizen environmental studies professor, but space exploration was there. It was always something I wanted to do because it was one of these stretches really far. And when you think about space exploration, it impacted everybody because this picture, you know, we always are looking now at orbital sunrises, right? Everybody knows that we're on this planet Earth. But the question I have to ask now, what are we today going to do to contribute to those same kinds of radical leaps? Franz Fanon, a Martinican psychiatrist, said, each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. We have to figure out what we're going to do with those radical leaps and how we're going to get there. But I guess first we actually have to talk about what is a radical leap. Mm, I think of it as a product, a concept, an idea, goods or services, something that we can change the world, something that actually transforms us from one generation to the next, something we can't go back for. It can be a policy, a decision. Think of the kinds of things that are radical leaps. They cause discontinuities in the way things were. You can't kill them uh, because they're there. We can actually remember them. Germ theory, it's a radical leap, right? The wheel, the light bulb, those are radical leaps, right? If you start to look at things like, um, how do we get to the hip hop with the Grammys? because of the lost poets, and uh, Gil Scott Heron talking about the revolution will not be televised. These are things that build up on each other. When we look at radical leaps in mathematics, so we can start counting on our toes, right? Then we get to an abacus, then we can get to a computer. These are things that are discontinuities. These are changes that happen, radical leaps. Some people want to have their hair straight permanently. Some people want to have their hair curly permanently. Permanence for a lot of people were radical leap, right? In technology and how do we see of the world. So these things can be daily activities. They can be things that happen very frequently. Why do we need them? Because of the overwhelming challenges that we face in the world today it can't be solved through incrementalism, through tiny baby steps. When we talk about the issue of climate change, when we talk about the loss of biodiversity, when we talk about about needing to feed everyone, when we talk about uh, why we have so much war, when we talk about toxins that are in the environment, when we talk about wanting to include everyone in the bounty of this world, they can't be solved with baby, baby steps and in incrementalism. We have to do something much bigger. But let me just do a one quick word about radical leaps in incrementalism. 
radical leaps aren't always good, right? There can be policies that are put into place. There can be things that we do. There can be weapons that we create that are not always wonderful. They're a radical leap, but they're not always wonderful. It's who's creating the technology that makes a difference. It's who's creating the policy that makes a difference. And incrementalism, we have to be careful because right now we're building our world on a lot of the work that was done in the 50s and the 60s. That's what's moving us forward. And we're making incremental improvements on it. And we pay for incremental improvements. That's how we get profits, right? So our profitability, we want to be able to make sure that it's going to happen, right? We want to be able to predict it, and we benefit from it. So we have to be really careful. Incrementalism is important sometimes, but we need to do it a little differently. The question is, what actually holds us back? Why aren't we doing bigger things? Why don't we do bigger things as governments, as people, as individuals? I think the first answer is people. The perceptions of who has the solution. So many times we want to go to the same people for the solutions over and over again, right? But we have to have different people in the teams. But we're sometimes afraid to have different people in the teams. We're very fearful that someone might get ahead of us, right? So that if we open a door, if we go someplace, someone may get ahead of us. And fear is particularly powerful when we think we're going to lose something, right? We have to be able to get beyond that. Fear keeps us from doing stuff. We're afraid that we may fail. But all of those things keep us from taking these risks. And I think one of the biggest ones is also looking back. We look back to the greatest generation, right? We look back to the glory days of Apollo. We have to be able to do more than that. We have to be able to look forward. We learn the lessons from the past. We build up on them. But we don't sit transfixed with them. So how do we generate radical leaps? We do it by, first of all, assembling a team that's transdisciplinary. Because none, of the problems that, because none of the problems that we have today can actually be solved by just one discipline. They have to be built up across a number of different disciplines. We also have to make sure that we choose a problem that's difficult enough, one that we don't know how to do very easily. Right? And then we have to understand that it's going to require commitment. So the problem also has to be one that people can feel comfortable and connected with. Those are the things we need to do. And so, of course, the work that I'm doing right now in leading 100-year Starship is really about pursuing an extraordinary tomorrow in order to create a better world today. We believe pursuing the extraordinary is what creates a better world today. When we look at some radical leaps in space, so you can start saying, well, what are we going to do in space? But I want to give you a couple of data points before we go on. If we start to look at some data points, the moon landing was in 1969. I hear people talking all the time about, we need to do a moonshot, right? That's, that's, the, that's the buzzword now. Moon landing happened in 69. To really appreciate the discontinuity between it, you need to be 54 years old or more. Let's say you were seven or eight, six, seven, eight years old. Right? You might be able to appreciate it. Sputnik moments. People talk about, oh, we need to have a Sputnik moment, right? To appreciate a Sputnik moment, when is Sputnik? 1957? You need to be 68 years old, plus or minus. So think about it. When we're using these terms, we keep looking back. Do those terms have the energy that they, they um, seem to have for some of us? The US population right now, uh, only 12%, 13% or 65 are older. Um, the median age is 38. The U.S. population, 20% of it is, um, or 25% of it is under 20 years of age. So that means when we're talking about these things, we have to recognize that for the time that most of these people, most of the people in the world have been alive, we were already on the moon. It's not the same big whoop it was when I was a little kid. It's a difference, right? That, that they've seen the moons of Saturn. And I have this picture of this great rover on Mars because we've been on Mars for all their lifetime. So when we start talking about Mars as a journey, we know how to do Mars. We know where it lives, right? There are some engineering challenges that are associated with it, but we could write out how to do that. This is an issue that we have to think about. How do you grab something that's going to capture us going into the future? This is a picture of me on the space shuttle. So 
If I didn't tell you that, if you didn't know who I was, or if you weren't really like a space geek, this almost looks like it could be a picture in the International Space Station, right? Yes. So we're doing space very the same way. In order to be able to do space so we can get to interstellar, it has to be transformational. It'll be the difference between being on the shuttle and being on the bridge of the Enterprise. Now, we're not going to necessarily meet Worf, but it's that kind of transformational thing. Let me tell you about how difficult it is and understand the interstellar travel. You put three grains of sand in a cathedral, and that cathedral is more packed with sand than spaces with stars. The issues that we look at are actually the distance. Things are very far apart. It means that it's going to take a very long time to get any place, right? The time and distance makes a difference. And then that means you have to be autonomy, autonomous because you can't send back for supplies or groceries, right? You're not going to necessarily sold out. So you have to understand all of these issues around sustainability. And then when you go into space, just think about it, 90% of it is dark, right? We don't know what's going on in 90% of it. How do we look at this? And so it's the extreme nature of these hurdles that really makes a difference. That's what pushes us. That's what drives the research. That's what makes us think list of all the kinds of things that happen that we have to do, whether you talk about having much better energy supplies, being able to understand the microbiome that you have to take with you, all those little microbes that go in your body, whether or not you have to talk about uh, ecosystems and manufacturing breakthroughs, sustainability, all of those things are really big, but I believe perhaps the biggest issue we have to face is human behavior. How do we behave? Because we could get so far out and we could do all the technological work, but unless our behavior changes, you know that 10 years out, almost to the start, somebody is going to say, well, I'm not doing what you told me to do because you're not in charge and I don't particularly like you. But we can start to look at human behavior now. That is one of the issues because everything that's required for an interstellar journey are the same things that are required to support our life form here on Earth. So I'm just going to go through it again. What we do with 100 Year Starship is really about inclusion because we want to have the right teams. We have people from textile designers to science fiction authors to um, biomedical engineering professors to people who are in religion, all the gamut of things because the problem is that big. When we start to think about radical leaps, we have to be audacious. Space exploration is supposed to be bold. People don't want you taking timid steps. They want us doing something bigger than we've done before. We need to have that adrenaline rush as humans. That's where we need to go. If we think about this, this is a journey that we've been on for hundreds of generations, for thousands of years. Because space exploration is actually built on the first people who looked up and said, you know what? Those points of light are moving, and they figured out what the relationship was. That's what we're building on now. So it's a common theme throughout our history. It's a journey that we have to commit to. When you look at radical leaps, they have to be transformative. So the whole issue about 100-year Starship is not about going and launching a mission. In fact, when we received the uh, seed funding grant from DARPA to work on this, it was really about how do you get the innovation that's going to transform life here on Earth and make things better. And that's the other part of it. What, what are we doing? It's about life here on Earth. The full range of life, not just one part, not just one thing. It's not just about the rocket engines. It's about who we are as a people. Because in fact, if we figured this all out, and we got all the energy done, and we didn't work on our behavior, our human behavior, our caring, how we interact with each other, then we would use that, that energy system for weaponry, which would leave us in a whole nother kettle of fish. It's about being on Earth. It's about seeing ourselves as Earthlings, because the reality is the most of us are not going to get off this planet. Our grandchildren, our grandchildren's grandchildren are not going to get off this planet. We're going to have to figure out how to be here ourselves. And this is about thinking beyond into the future, that we are connected, that we can move further, that everything that we do is impacting us. So 100 Year Starship is really an inclusive, audacious journey to transform life here on Earth and beyond. We believe that there is a better future for us, but in order for us to get there, we have to have an inspiring, inclusive, collective ambition for humanity. That's where we're really moving and going. 
Eugene Cernan said, we went to explore the moon and in fact we discovered the Earth. The question I would ask is what would we discover from another star? And finally, because this seems so deep, because it seems like sometimes when we're working on things, Cynthia Hamill said, when in doubt, make a fool of yourself. There's a microscopically thin line between being the most gigantic idiot on earth and being considered brilliant. So what the hell, leap. Radical leaps. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, so you talked about some audacious things there. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about in that human behavior piece that you're focusing on, uh, what are the biggest challenges in that area? So when we think about human behavior here on Earth, so 100 Year Starship is really about capabilities, making sure capabilities exist. And when you think about it, yes, we can talk about food, we can talk about things like that, but it's really how do we see each other, how do we commit to long-term projects, how do we invest in a future that we may not see? So many times we become short-sighted and everything is about what I'm going to get right now today. So how do we move forward? And I think that's one of the big investments. I'm struck by the fact when we talk about um, food and agriculture, everyone says there are people who are hungry on Earth, but yet right now we generate enough food to feed everyone on this planet right now, yet we waste over 40% of the food that we have in the United States. It's an issue about sharing. And the thing that 100 Year Starship, and when we start to look at interstellar and going someplace else, what it does is helps us to use and understand that we're in this one place, this one environment, and can we see ourselves as a starship? We have to think about it as how right. do we share these things. Absolutely. And so tell, tell me a little bit about why it's important to think not just about the technology, but about the people. Uh, we got to get out of the way. Um, why to think about not just the physical stuff, right? Because the, the, the metal, the pieces of things. Because first of all, people make those things. And for 100 Year Starship, again, we're looking at the capabilities and how do we apply them to life here on Earth. Think about it. If we don't figure out how to create financial investment vehicles for the long term, we'll never get things done. If we don't figure out um, how to work in teams. Mm -hmm. We're never going to get things done. If we can't figure out how people can have different religions and be in the same room and be on the same planet, look how big this planet is, and we can't figure it out. So if you looked at a starship, we'd have to think about those things. How do we move them forward? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Let's thank You're May again. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much.